Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alekos Theologis. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at UCSF. And I'd like you to welcome you to this week's Interesting Case Conference on Primary Spine Tumors. Um, as an outline for this talk, um, I'll start with a 20 to 30 minute discussion um, on types of primary spine tumors, benign and malignant, discuss treatment strat strategies for each, um, and also touch upon reconstructive techniques. Um, but uh, really the focus will be on um, four case presentations, um, one um, on the cervical spine, thoracic and lumbar and sacral spine. Um, we have a nice um, cadre of individuals who will be speaking today, um, uh, faculty members from the, both the orthopedic as well as the neurosurgery departments at UCSF are listed here. Um, and I'd like to thank the fellows, Ian McNeil, Joseph Mandelis and Tim Lockney, um, both from orthopedics as well as neurosurgery, who will be uh, presenting the cases. So as a brief introduction, uh, primary spine tumors are relatively rare. Um, only 11% of all primary musculoskeletal tumors um, and 4.2% of them are all spine tumors. Um, and then interestingly, of all the primary spine tumors, only 6% are malignant. Um, in terms of types, you can break them down into two major categories, intradural and extradural. You can see the intradural can be extramedullary and intramedullary, and examples are shown for each, and then extradural um, are shown on the right, which are commonly metastatic in uh, the primary spine tumors that um, we're, we're familiar with. These intradural tumors won't be the focus of this talk because whenever I see images like this, um, my first thought is consult neurosurgery. So uh, this is a talk for um, uh, a different time. So we'll really be focusing on the extradural tumors um, that can be broken down into benign and malignant. Um, in terms of the benign spine tumors, and some of this will be review for um, most of us, but I wanted to make it digestible for everybody. So you can think about benign spine tumors. Um, there's a laundry list of them, but you can get a sense of uh, what type they are based on the location. They have predilection for anterior uh, part of the spine, some of that predilection for the posterior elements. Um, the anterior column, hemangioma, eosinophilic granulomas, giant cell tumors, ABCs, and fibrous dysplasia tend to favor the anterior column. For posterior elements, the most common ones are osteoid osteoma, osteoblastoma, chondromas, ABCs can see fall into both categories and osteochondromas. The goals of treatment for benign primary spine tumors really depends on the type of tumor and we'll get into the N and King classification, which I like to help uh, break them down into different types. Um, but pain relief is a major goal. Stabilization and neural decompression are indicated if um, instability um, and or uh, neural uh, compromise um, are uh, present respectively, and then preventing recurrence is also um, one of the goals. So the Enkin classification, um, there's really three stages, one, two, and three is shown on the left, one and two are intercompartmental, and three is extra compartmental. Um, the characteristics differ between different stages, so you see the type one, these are latent lesions that, that are incidentally discovered um, on uh, imaging, they have well demarcated borders, Type twos are more active, they're symptomatic. They also have demarcated borders with cortical thinning. And then the type three are the locally aggressive tumors. These ones, um, as the name implies, are ag aggressive um, and are bad actors. They have indistinct borders, they have potential for malignant conversion. So examples within each um, are shown here. You can see for type or stage one, bone islands, mangiomas, osteochondromas, and eosinophilic granulomas. Stage two, osteoblastomas, aggressive mangiomas, and then three, giant cells, osteoblastoma, ABCs, and chondroblastomas. Treatment, um, the traditional teaching is that for those that are um, essentially, if they're asymptomatic, you don't really need to do anything um, unless there's um, decompression or stabilization that's needed. For the active lesions, the intralesional excision plus or minus local adjuvants is recommended. We'll get into some of those um, briefly. And for those that are in stage three, um, an unblock excision has been demonstrated to um, give you the best chance of limiting local recurrence and future uh, morbidity. So in terms of, uh, these are just examples, really the point of these slides is to show you radiographic CT and MRI examples of each type. Um, hemangiomas you see on the left has this um, popcorn 
their stippled appearance and the uh, jail bar on x-rays. Bone, bone islands are pretty nondescript. Uh, Osteochondromas, you can see, um, have these large overgrowths um, similar to the, um, uh, to the extremities and the eosinophilic granulomas, as you can see here, commonly present with vertebral plana um, in the younger individuals and are, are self-limited the majority of times. Um, stage two, um, the Anna King, classically osteoidosteoma, you see the nidus um, on the left, um, best seen on CT scan and often missed on MRI. And then aggressive hemangiomas um, can, can, be, can look pretty nasty. And then for the stage three, um, the example of giant cell uh, predilection for the, the sacrum, but also can occur um, really anywhere. Osteoblastoma is similar to osteoidosteomas, but uh, larger, again, in the posterior elements. And those ABCs, you can see the fluid fluid levels, which are very characteristic, commonly in the posterior elements as seen on the right, but also as you see um, to the right, you can have uh, extension into the middle and anterior column. Wanted to mention the tumor specific adjuvant therapies. Um, so, mangiomas can be treated with embolization, radiation uh, if they're symptomatic, and sclerotherapy with ethanol. Have to be careful with that. Um, ABCs, embolization has been um, shown to be a, an effective treatment. Giant cells, um, if an unblock is too morbid, um, possibly doing serial embolizations is, is a reasonable. Um, uh, treatment. And denosumab, this rank ligand inhibitor, has really changed uh, changed the game for giant cell tumors. I think anybody who has a giant cell tumor um, shouldn't be considered for denosumab, um, especially before surgery. Osteoidosteomas um, can be treated in pain relief with NSAIDs, and a lot of times they're just self-limited and will burn out over time. So moving our attention towards malignant tumors, um, again, if we look at um, different parts of the spine, we can get a sense of what these may be, but clearly a uh, biopsy is the uh, gold standard for diagnosing, diagnosing them. Chordomas have um, uh, and plasmocytomas, lymphomas, and multiple myeloma are most commonly in the anterior column. Posterior elements, osteosarcoma, chondrosarcs, and Ewing's um, are common, but again, um, they can extend the middle column as well as the anterior column. Additional clues, um, if you look at an MRI or CT and you see a central base lesion, particularly in the uh, upper cervical or uh, sacrum, um, that is uh, very suggestive of a chordoma, it's, it's midline, whereas those that are off-center are more um, likely to be non-chordoma, just osteosarcs, chondrosarcs, um, et cetera. So goals of treatment are slightly different or very different than the benign tumors. Really, if a patient has an isolated disease to the spine, so no metastatic disease, really the goal is to prevent local recurrence and improve overall survival. I'll get into some of those data uh, shortly. But again, uh, pain relief, stabilization if there's instability, and then neural decompression um, if, uh, if present is, is, are also goals of, of surgery or treatment. Metastatic disease, um, if it's present, then the surgery is more palliative. And so the reason why surgery is really recommended for these primary spine tumors that have uh, isolated disease in the spine without metastases, is you can see that patients who have distal metastases for the four most common tumors, Ewing sarc, um, osteosarc, chondrosarc, and chordoma, are dramatically lower than if it's just isolated to the spine. Um, again, you know, no surgery for these, these four categories of tumors um, really portends a, a poor outcome, but surgery, especially if you can get uh, negative margins, um, has, a, has a beneficial effect on, on survival. And then another thing to consider, um, this is a more recent study in 2017, um, demonstrated that treatment of spinal tumors in high volume centers has direct impact on local recurrence, morbidity, mortality, and uh, the authors in this group um, stated that it's reasonable to conclude that the whole treatment from biopsy to resection should be performed in the same center. And this should be at a high volume specialized uh, center treating these types of spine pathologies. So in treatment summary from ligand tumors, patient has no metastatic disease. Surgical intervention um, in the form of unblocked resection is um, advisable. Um, if there is metastatic disease that's present, then um, the surgery is more um, 
palliative and non-surgical management can be um, uh, favored. And then clearly because of this distinction, um, a metastatic disease or workup for metastatic disease is important um, to include a CT chest in particular. And then again, ref consider referring to high volume centers for biopsy and subsequent multidisciplinary management. And then the, the type of uh, neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation should be uh, uh, decided in close conjunction with medical oncologists and radiation uh, oncologists. So I wanted to um, move into how we think or how I think about planning for unblock excisions. And really first is it define the extent of the disease uh, and it can give us uh, some insight into that. Choosing surgical approaches, which I think is better um, guided by the, um, the WBB um, classification. And then um, depending on which surgical approach you choose and also which part of the spine involving a multidisciplinary team, general surgeons, vascular surgeons, cardiothoracic, and or plastic surgeons as uh, indicated is, is very important. So I wanted to bring this up. Um, the Anakin classification on the malignant side is broken down into three grades or three um, subclassifications. So low grade um, one, high grade is two, and metastatic disease is three. And then within each one of these um, categories, you can have A or B. A is intercompartmental and B is extra compartmental. And again, this doesn't really guide um, how you do the surgery, but it just, again, points to the low grade and high grade favor surgery with metastatic disease or an unblock excision, excuse me, for grade, low grade and high grade where metastatic disease is um, the, the palliative treatment. So I use the um, WBB surgical uh, system as a way of first or thinking about how I'm gonna choose my approach. Um, you can see that in this uh, classification, the, um, the spine is broken up into a clock with regions from one to 12. Also it's broken from A to E, uh, from superficial to deep respectively. And I wanted to go through a couple, you know, pictorial examples of how you may use this to decide your surgical approach. So say, for example, you have a tumor in the anterior um, column between zone four to nine slightly crosses the midline, but you have some bone on the um, other side. Well, usually the treatment for this um, favors a posterior and anterior operation. So start with a posterior operation. You can cut the pedicles um, at their bases. You can perform a sagittal osteotomy um, and then remove the posterior elements on block. Excuse me, this should have gone around the entire um, spine, uh, entire posterior elements. We'll see if these, if these uh, lines behave themselves. And that is then um, followed by doing an anterior operation where you can then remove the remainder of the soft tissue and um, remove this unblock. Um, in the case where you have um, a tumor that extends and occupies the entire vertebral body, um, again, you can do a posterior and anterior operation. Posterior operation involves similar um, strategy. When you do an anterior operation, um, especially in the thoracic spine with a lumbar spine, you may not be able to access um, that contralateral side uh, completely. And so in this case, you may have to do a contralateral uh, third approach. Uh, one of our fellows, Ian McNeil, um, will demonstrate a case that required um, a bilateral anterior operation to fully uh, achieve an unblocked resection. When it comes to posterior-based um, lesions, so say here in zone one to three, this can be approached just through a posterior uh, based operation um, and really you have to try to find places where you can break the, the donut, break the circle in two places um, to remove this on block. If it extends a little past midline, it's still okay. You can approach it posteriorly. Again, break the, the donut in two places and remove that on block. And then lastly, the ones that cross the equator, um, it's ventral or dorsal. These are uh, challenging, but again, posterior and anterior operation is going to achieve this. Um, obviously one size doesn't fit all, so you have to really study the images for this, but um, just as, a, as an example, approaching this from the back, kind of the pedicle again, spinous process, removing, um, you can do a sagittal osteotomy here to help with your anterior uh, removal, remove the good part uh, piecemeal, and then go to the front, um, dissect the soft tissue and remove it on block anteriorly. Um, 
it extends more, you know, almost circumferentially. Again, you can uh, approach it posteriorly, remove this piecemeal, and again, you may not be able to reach that contralateral side with a, a unilateral operation. You may have to go to the other side to get that. Um, but clearly, that's just thinking about it in, in two dimensions um, in the axial plane. You have to assess the sagittal image to get extent of what the cranial caudal um, extent of the disease is, and that will dictate which level you do your discectomies at, so you can fully um, uh, complete your unblocked resection. And um, I just wanted to show you an example of a patient of mine from a couple of years back, 60-year-old male, mild mid-back pain. You see this large right-sided um, tumor centered at T9. Biopsy demonstrated to be a grade two rhabdomyosarcoma, had no metastatic disease, underwent neoadjuvant neo radiation, but there was subsequent growth. It was not unstable and had um, a normal neural exam, um, but um, we plan on addressing this uh, from the back uh, and the front. So we did a posterior operation. We cut the pedicles, did a sagittal osteotomy on the left, um, and then removed that piecemeal that went to the front a couple days later through a thoracotomy with our cardiothoracic surgeons um, and able, was able to remove it on block. Um, again, we only had to take out one vertebral body um, and looking at the sagittal images, it looks like it does extend eventually, but these discs at T8-9 and T9-10 were accessible just by peeling a little bit of tumor off uh, anteriorly, so we didn't need to extend um, our our, corp or, our uh, unblocked resection uh, a level or two below. But that is something very important to, to assess to dictate your extent of, um, of resection. Uh, these are his post-op radiographs. And um, he had negative margins and has been disease-free since. Special considerations, we won't go into this too much, but in the cervical spine, obviously, if the tumor encases the vertebral artery and you're trying to assess um, whether you should do an unblocked resection or not. Um, th there has been descriptions of the need for vertebral artery occlusion test to see if that will cause any neurologic uh, sequelae. Um, some people now have been a little bit more bold and have sacrificed the artery uh, without doing a, an occlusion test, but um, I think it's still important to, to assess this um, preoperatively. And then cervical thoracic, upper thoracic tumors, they have in of themselves unique approaches, manubriotomy, the sternotomy, shown in the middle, and then uh, Rex Marco um, published this several years back in the European Spine Journal on a high muscle sparing uh, thoracotomy to access these high thoracic tumors. Um, we'll have the pleasure of seeing an upper thoracic, um, cervical thoracic tumor um, like Dr. Mulineni and Dr. Lockney um, to demonstrate this uh, sternotomy technique. Um, and I think you guys will enjoy that. Other thing to consider when you're planning these operations is what years you're gonna be your anterior reconstructive option. Um, an old school technique is using uh, cement uh, with a rebar as shown on the left, um, but more commonly nowadays, um, cages, either peak or titanium are used. I uh, show examples of static cages as shown in A, um, and then different types of cages that have cylindrical um, base plates or rectangular base plates as shown in D and E. Um, our options. The ones that are rectangular um, end plates um, have been reported to have less subsidence um, because it, it engages the apotheosial ring, but these are challenging to place, uh, especially from a posterior uh, approach in the thoracic spine. Um, another special consideration of the sacral tumors. Um, I wanted to touch upon this um, as our last go, talk about approaches. Um, the general algorithm for, for these approaches, stabilization options and then soft tissue coverage. So the traditional teaching in my usual rule of thumb is that if the lesion is located at S1, S2, or S3, so S3 and above, I prefer doing an anterior and posterior operation and doing these all from the back, even though they've been described, can be somewhat dicey, especially if the vessels uh, making cuts from the front to the back. Um, whereas lesions that are below S3, posterior operations are, are uh, definitely favorable. Anterior approach can be um, midline transperitoneal or retroperitoneal. Getting vascular surgeons involved with this is important. And then depending on your level of sacrectomy, if they're planning on, you think they're going to include bladder and bowel function, then uh, performing a colostomy at the time of the anterior operation is definitely 
um, something that we do at UCSF uh, just to protect the posterior incision from any soilage uh, that may occur if they do have uh, bowel incontinence. Uh, posterior approach, um, the workhorse is midline, but this uh, horseshoe um, incision has been demonstrated or used. And then um, in terms of stabilization for sacrectomies, if it's below S3 or below the SI joints, no stabilization is, is really required. Um, this is, I wanted to show you an example of, of when we did this. Um, this is a 56 year old female presented with this uh, relatively small midline lesion in S4 and S5. You can see it's midlines that suggest that it's a chordoma, but we confirmed it with a biopsy. She had no metastatic disease and we were able to do an on-block resection, um, achieving negative margins and not stabilizing it. Um, she's been disease-free for nearly three years now. Um, stabilization for is usually necessary. I would advocate it if you are going to disrupt the SI joints, so S3 and above, um, but it all really depends on how much your SI joints you can um, save. Options for lumbopelvic stabilization are um, met or, or there's a myriad of, op of options and the most tr traditional one is the Galveston technique is shown on the left, but very uncommonly used these days. Uh, single bolts in each, um, each side may not provide you with the stability that you're looking for. So I favor at least two iliac bolts, um, but other options are shown here. Some centers have advocated for these cross connectors um, to kind of re recreate the um, uh, the sacrum um, can be just instrumentation rods or can put a femoral uh, ring allograft as shown on the right. Uh, and then other centers have advocated for anterior column fixation, so we're running some fibular allograft, either um, uh, vascularized or non vascularized from the lumbar spine or sacrum down to the uh, pubic bone. I wanted to show this ex case example. Um, this is one of my patients, 24 year old male, relatively healthy, presented with mild low back pain. Um, MRI and CT scan show this um, osteoblastic lesion in the right, um, right sacrum. It did extend past midline uh, to the uh, left and extended up to the S2 segment. He does have some transitional anatomy, so we called this S2. Biopsy showed that it was osteosarc um, and had no metastatic disease. We planned for an unblock uh, excision because it extended high up to about S2, we planned for an anterior and posterior operation. Um, the anterior operation consisted for, of an ALIF L3 to S1 um, to you know, maximize its chances of, of healing. Um, we, we sacrificed the right internal iliac. Uh, we did an anterior sacral osteotomy and placed a silicone sheet um, anteriorly to help prevent any um, potential vascular injury when we made our cuts from the back. And we did perform a colostomy at the time. These are our um, ALIF cages. And then I won't belabor the point, but, but posteriorly we went L3 to the pelvis. Um, we had to sacrifice the right sciatic nerve because the, the tumor was, it was invading the sciatic notch. Um, we used navigation to help with the right iliac bolts because we had to sacrifice some of that right SI joint. And we did a vascularized right free fibula um, from the S1 body with the right ilium. This is our final construct, um, the final tumor we achieved negative margins. And uh, these were our final x-rays. You can see on the right side, that side, right side that uh, free fibula autographed. And he's been disease free for almost a year now. Um, and then lastly, you want to touch upon soft tissue coverage. This is uh, really emphasizing that uh, getting your colleagues involved early and understanding where you may need assistance from them is important. If you're going to do a high sacral um, uh, sacrectomy through S1 or S2, um, then you can consider doing what's called a VRAM flap. In that first guy, a VRAM wasn't necessary because the soft tissue uh, defect in the back wasn't planned on being that significant, but I'll show you a case where it was. Um, and then for lower um, sacrectomies, local advancement flaps or local flaps can be uh, more uh, suitable. So the VRAM stands for vertical rectus uh, abdominis my myocutaneous flap. As you can see in this picture, you sacrifice usually the right rectus. Um, you then, its pedicle is the inferior epigastric, you dock it in the abdomen, um, and then in your second stage, you essentially take it from the abdomen and then pull it back to cover your soft tissue defect. 
Um, for smaller defects, these local flaps, keystone flaps, unilateral pediculated superior luteal artery flaps um, are common. So this is the last case example um, of mine that I showed, and then we'll move on to the other cases. 67-year-old male, very large midline sacral tumor extended up to S3 um, or S2. Um, biopsy demonstrated that it was chordoma, and he had no metastatic disease. Um, this was his skin uh, presentation, so it was compromising the skin. And we ended up, ended up, ended up going uh, through with neoadjuvant radiation to help see if it could shrink the tumor and then plan an anterior and posterior operation. We did a VRAM flap uh, harvest in the front as well as a colostomy and partial subcorectomy in the back. Um, so this is an example of his VRAM um, and then incision heal at about a year on the right side there, his colostomy. Um, this was a soft tissue defect that was uh, remaining after the sacrectomy as well as sacrificing of the fascia and the skin. Um, you can see this is the muscle uh, being pulled through from the abdomen to the back. Um, and you de-epithelialize the proximal portion to tuck it into that uh, defect proximally. Uh, this was his, at the end of the case on the left and then healed at about a year. Um, and then we were able to achieve negative margins. You can see here that even though it was a relatively high sacral osteotomy uh, or sacral sacrectomy, that the SI joints were preserved um, and we didn't instrument him. Hopefully this will hold up over time. So when these things go well, it's very, it's very uh, satisfying. However, the complication profile for these patients is extremely high. I tell people there's a 100% chance you're gonna have a complication. I just don't know what it's gonna be. Um, but you have to inform that it's gonna be a rocky road, potentially a rocky road. Um, but if you can get them through that, uh, those complications, um, they can do well. So in conclusion, uh, just for time's sake, um, I won't go through all this, but um, these are uncommon tumors, uh, very satisfying in terms of surgeries, um, but they do have a high complication profile and it's important to have a multidisciplinary team to uh, help um, not only preoperatively, but, but postoperatively to achieve the best um, treatment for these patients. So with that, I think we'll move on to our interesting cases. Um, we'll first start with Ian McNeil. Um, he is one of our, he's actually a neurosurgeon, but has come over to the dark side and is doing an orthopedic surgery fellowship, uh, or orthopedic spine surgery fellowship. Um, and I think you guys will really enjoy this um, case on a lumbar spine primary tumor. The attendings for this were Fidat Dever and Christopher Ames. Um, I'm not sure if they're on, but um, I'll have Ian walk you through this. Thank you, Dr. Theodis. So this is a case, the patient is a 72 year old female, history of uh, protein C deficiency, prior mesenteric vein thrombosis on warfarin, um, who actually presented to RED with one month of progressive, unrelenting right-sided back and hip pain. Uh, that was refractory to multiple medications, including opiates. Uh, of note, she had actually undergone a biopsy at an outside hospital about a month prior. Um, and uh, there she had received a uh, diagnosis of chordoma, but had not gone, un undergone any further treatment or workup. Um, she had no other neurological, no, no neurological symptoms, um, but due to the pain, she was unable to ambulate um, and perform her ADLs. Um, she was seen um, after the presentation within a week as an outpatient um, by our symptom um, management team, as well as Dr. Ames, um, and then proceeded with uh, this MRI um, lumbar spine with and without contrast. So uh, on the left, you have the T2, uh, essentially the tumor was a T2 and T1 hyperintense um, lesion extending from uh, T11, T12. Um, and it was also demonstrates uh, heterogeneous en enhancement. You can see the tumor extends, uh, it's extra compartmental. Uh, it abuts the right kidney. Uh, it also displaces the aorta as well as the uh, inferior vena cava. Um, and then in terms of the WBB classification, you can see from a clock phase perspective, it extends probably from four um, all the way to the post, includes the, um, in the posterior elements and invades um, uh, and extends into the dura.
this is the uh, CT, um, again, demonstrating uh, the tumor extending from T11, 12, um, and uh, uh, so here is her, here are her standing films. Um, of what was notable here is that she had some uh, slightly pitched forward in terms of saddle balance, but she had essentially uh, a, a flat back with only about 22 degrees of lumbar lordosis uh, with a PI of 48. Um, that came into play in terms of the surgical planning. Um, so overall, this is a 72 year old female T12 to L2 chordoma with dural involvement extending into the right retroperitoneal space, peritoneal space, but also budding um, uh, the uh, IVC and minimally displacing the aorta. Uh, she had no prior abdominal surgery. And so uh, within a, a couple weeks after her initial presentation, she was also evaluated by vascular and vascular surgery as well as urology. Um, the outside hospital pathology slides were obtained and reviewed internally to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, given her um, um, or, or a previous uh, mesenteric vein thrombosis and diagnosis of protein C deficiency, she was high risk for DVT or P. She underwent a pre-op IBC filter placement. And uh, we planned, uh, or Dr. Ames and Dr. Devon planned a stage combined approach with neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, and vascular surgery for an M block resection, uh, correction of her flat back deformity, and uh, a procedure to stabilize the spine. So the surgery was actually in two, three stages. The first stage uh, included a T5 to S1 posterior instrumentation with hooks at T5, dual pelvic bolts. Um, laminectomy was performed with the bone scalpel from T11 to L3, L3 to S1. Um, uh, posterior column osteotomies were performed to help with the flat back deformity correction. Anterior osteotomies, anterior and posterior osteotomies were performed at T11, 12, and L2, 3, um, and uh, as well as the posterior osteotomy at T7 and T10. Obviously, the T12 and L1 nerve roots had to be um, sacrificed. Um, there was a small dural rent that had to be repaired primarily with a muscle patch and durigen. Um, and uh, bone graft material was allograft. Um, so stage two and three were performed uh, about a week later. Um, and so this involved uh, both the left-sided and right-sided ap approach to facilitate end block resection. Uh, so the, the left-sided uh, thoracal lumbar approach was from T11 to TL3. Um, and osteotomies were performed at T11, 12, L2, 3 for tumor mobilization and dissection of the soft tumor. Uh, and then the, there was also a right-sided thoracolumbar approach uh, involving a T, T10 rib resection, complete disectomies, completion of the disectomies at T11, 12, and L2, L2 3, um, and, and M block anterior corpectomy of the tumor extending from T12 to L3. Um, so these images, can you can see the um, uh, the uh, M block, uh, actually the discectomies done uh, above and below. And then there was anterior spinal reconstruction done with an uh, uh, expandable cage. So here's this demonstration of the uh, expandable peak cage. And uh, postoperatively, she had an extended course uh, about seven weeks post op as an inpatient. Uh, her neuro exam remained stable. Um, she required thoracentesis for drainage of pleural fusions. Her lumbar drain remained in place for three weeks post-op for management of uh, a symptomatic CSF leak since she was becoming uh, symptomatic whenever she stood upright. Um, finally, the lumbar drain came out and then she was eventually discharged to acute rehab at seven weeks post-op. And in terms of follow-up, um, she's currently starting her radiation therapy to the resection cavity to include 40 gray and five daily fractions. Um, here are, are her post-op films um, demonstrating the instrumentation. Um, you can see the, the M block resection cavity here. Um, there were a uh, good, uh, good correction of her flat back deformity and loss of lordosis. And uh, at approximately, it's about nine months out yet, um, the overall instrumentation looks stable. Um, and she's uh, able to ambulate and doing well. Any 
questions from the audience. This is Jens Chapman. Hi. 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 Thank you for showing this case. This is brutal. Um, I have a simple question and a harder one. So the simple question is, this is a beautiful and very deliberate, very thoughtful, staged in the true sense of the word approach. So congratulations on that and carrying a complex patient through this uh, with foresight. The simple question is, should we nowadays for on block resections pretty routinely use four rod constructs uh, instead of the previous two rod era, just basically acknowledging that we're not going to have bone healing. So that's my, my first simple question. I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, sure. I, I think uh, having worked with Dr. Devron and Dr. Ames early in this fellowship year, I think they've adopted a four rod construct uh, for generally all of their deformities. So I, I think that's um, become standard for their practice. Dr. Thielo, do you have any input? Yeah, um, Dr. Chapman, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, I do think that in tumors in particular, um, achieving fusion, especially over log segments, as was shown in this case, is very challenging um, because partly because they're going to have uh, radiation. Um, so in my hands, I uh, would do at least four rods. Um, and so I, I would do that, not just for increasing stability, but hopefully preventing uh, rod breakage at an early stage. The second question is more contentious. Um, and that is, um, I've been around the block now for three decades and uh, literally every single primary tumor that I've gotten, and I get probably one a month, has received the benefits, dubious benefits of some previous treatment, usually in form of a well-intended uh, MIS procedure with complete misunderstanding of the beautifully presented principles that you've outlined. Is this just uh, a far out Northwestern phenomenon? Have you seen similar kind of uh, events nowadays uh, in your area? I'll, I'll field that because I don't think Ian's been in this area for long enough. Um, I think that we're uh, somewhat, uh, I, I have not seen that myself. Um, I have seen the situation where um, the diagnosis wasn't made accurately and that resulted in, I think, less than ideal uh, care and management. But um, I haven't seen the MIS approach um, uh, in, the, in these situations. That, that's encouraging. So, so this is something I literally struggle with in every patient. There's been either way overdone radiation with completely burned tissue. So I really appreciate your emphasis on soft tissue reconstructions. Um, or there's been a very improvisational surgical care and uh, with hardware transgressing boundaries with a lack of understanding of resection of the posterior longitudinal ligaments so that there's a true epidural disease resection rostrally and caudally uh, to the primary manifestation. So that's a uh, that's a big deal for me. So maybe it's just a far out thing and I get the curve balls, but uh, I think um, uh, I, I'm looking forward to your suggestions in terms of how to spread the news uh, of the Boriani paper of trying to concentrate these uh, uh, cases on select centers. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I think getting um, that information out um, to the masses is is hard, and hopefully venues like this um, can can help with that. Um, but I think it will take take some time, and I think if we can make some strides in it, um, to, then you know any any step in the right direction will help. But I don't think it will happen overnight. Um, well, thank you for those questions. Um, I think we'll move on to the next talk. And um, I'm excited for you guys to see this one. Um, I'll introduce uh, Tim Lockney. Um, he is a um, fellow this year with Dr. Uh, Praveen Mumaneni. And uh, this is a case that I don't think he was involved in 
um, but he's done a very nice job putting it together. And um, take it away, Tim. Great, thank you so much. Um, appreciate being a part of this. This is a, a really valuable and interesting uh, topic. I think it's one that, uh, like we've talked about, is pretty rare. Um, and so maybe uh, people need a little more education on it. I thought you had a great introduction, so thanks for letting me be a part of this. Um, and again, thanks to uh, Dr. Bourbon, Dr. Mumineni, um, and also Dr. Chow for uh, their assistance with this. So uh, we're gonna talk about uh, cervical thoracic um, primary spine tumor. Okay, um, so in terms of the case presentation, it's actually fairly simple. This was a 20-year-old uh, female. She actually presented to her primary care doctor with shortness of breath. He ordered a chest x-ray, and interestingly, this revealed a large left posterior mediastinal mass. Um, otherwise, she had no medical history, non-smoker, took no medications, and on neurologic and physical exam, uh, she was intact. Uh, so this is actually the chest x-ray, and, and I'm not sure if it projects well over the zoom, but, but if you can see my mouse, I'm sort of circling over that uh, sort of superior portion uh, on the left lung and mediastinum where you can see this large uh, mass there, I think it's around eight centimeters or so. Um, pretty uncommon and otherwise healthy 20-year-old to have that. So this led to further imaging and, and characterization of this lesion, including an MRI, uh, which you can see here. Uh, on the top left, there's a coronal view, and you can see that uh, the tumor is uh, predominantly in the left posterior mediastinum. It uh, seems to be emanating from the upper thoracic spine. Um, and then in the bottom uh, image, you can see, again, this is just a large uh, tumor that is in the upper thoracic spine, uh, displacing the lungs uh, on the left side and a little bit on the right side. And then the sagittal, you can see uh, it appears to be emanating uh, from this uh, vertebral body, and I'll tell you just the numbers are going to be T2 down to uh, T4, uh, and you can see there's some displacement in, in contact of the, uh, the spinal cord there as well. And um, to take a little closer look at the anatomy, this, this is a pretty uh, expensive real estate region. Um, what you can see is, is this is the tumor in the crosshashes, and then you can see the trachea is being displaced. Obviously, the trachea, as we know, is a midline structure, particularly at that level, uh, and you can see it's a bit narrowed and, and displaced, uh, helping to explain part of her trouble breathing. Uh, in the red, you can see some of the great vessels. This is the junction of the aorta, the left uh, common carotid and the right brachiocephalic artery. And then the smaller uh, artery right here, just overlying the tumor, um, nicely situated is the left uh, subclavian artery. Uh, so the workup um, involved in this, so, so again, this is a, a T1 enhancing and a T2 hyperintense uh, lesion based out of the vertebral bodies. It's like we talked about, extended into the thoracic cavity and the posterior mediastinum, dominantly on the left side. Uh, so the imaging is most consistent with a primary um, spinal tumor, and uh, she ended up, uh, for our next steps, I'll just sort of to the chase for the sake of time, but ended up getting a biopsy, and that biopsy came back as a chordoma. And as you mentioned, the biopsy is important because it affects the uh, treatment plan. Um, some of these you want, uh, the goal is an on-block resection with wide margins. Other, or other tumors are more amenable to intralesional curatage, and you don't have the risk of seeding and so forth. Um, so she underwent a biopsy to help determine the surgical plan. Um, and so the surgical plan was, was actually in two stages. Stage um, one was gonna be involving a posterior uh, instrumented uh, stabilization. So that was done from C5 down to T8, uh, complete with T1 and two, and then T4 and five discectomies, release of the annulus and the posterior elements, uh, as also uh, new ver sorry, nerve root sacrifice. So posterior elements from the spinous process down to the pedicles were removed. Uh, at those levels. And then stage two uh, involved a multidisciplinary team, uh, including the cardiothoracic surgeons to uh, perform a bilateral thoracotomy, again, to complete the on-block resection after the tumor had been released from the posterior aspect and the nerve roots had been sacrificed. Uh, the next step is to come from anterior approach and remove the tumor on block. Uh, and so that was done, uh, and also to remove the T2 to 4 vertebral bodies and then reconstruct the anterior columns. So this is a video. Um, so uh, we skipped the posterior portion, but, but you can see the um, 40. Uh, 
uh, approach done where they're actually performing, uh, this is actually part of the sternotomy here. Um, but initially back on the slide, you can see where, where the plan was just for the left side. So this is the anatomy that, that neurosurgeons are not particularly familiar with and we'll go over again, but uh, this was the view from uh, the left side of the patient. And so it's nice to have a multidisciplinary team to let you know what you can touch and not touch, uh, particularly in an unfamiliar anatomy. Uh, and you can see it the, uh, uh, here, the, the lungs and the heart are beating. This is the bilateral uh, clamshell thoracotomy uh, that's been performed uh, with the assistance of the cardio uh, thoracic surgeons. Um, once the tumor had been released, actually, this is sort of the final step, and you can see the, uh, in terms of the tumor resection, and it, it came out in a nice uh, single uh, on block uh, piece. And so that's the actual tumor. Uh, it's been resected there. And then here we can see uh, this is the anterior column reconstruction using a, a large uh, expandable cage as well as um, uh, rib autograft. And that's the final construct there. You can see again from C5 down to T8, reconstruction of the anterior vertebral bodies there. And you can, you can actually see the uh, sternotomy wiring close. So um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so again, this is just some of that anatomy. Uh, this is what it looks like in the actual operating room. And then here's a nice guide. Um, you can see the pericardium, the mediastinum, and then uh, way down here, the tumor. So there's a lot of things in the way. And also the pleura, which had to be uh, uh, partially dissected off and some of that removed. Uh, the initial approach we'll talk about in a minute. Oh, sorry, here's another good picture. Um, so you can see this is the right lung. This is a nice vessel loop. Uh, the heart and pericardium are here. You can see the great vessels emanating from there. That's the manubrium, the pleura, and the chest wall. Uh, so this is not a common uh, view uh, for the spinal surgeon or the neurosurgeon. Um, and so having that interdisciplinary team is very helpful. And again, there's the tumor. Um, I'll say during the uh, tumor resection, actually, there was a neuromonitoring change and mobilization of it. Um, the motors were down in the legs, but okay in the arms. Um, and so that, that uh, raises, obviously, some concern. And at this point, uh, the bilateral chest wall was open. The tumor was mostly free, but there were some pleural attachments that were being freed as it was being uh, removed. And so um, uh, Dr. Mumineni, uh, Dr. Ziwas wrote a nice paper on what to do uh, when you get neuromonitoring changes. And that involves each portion of the operation from the neurophysiologist to the anesthesiologist to the surgeon, running through a checklist of what to do and what not to do. Uh, I won't belabor those changes, uh, but uh, suffice it to say this is available. It's very useful. And they went through the checklist uh, and ended up finding that uh, with further explanation, there was a, a nerve root which had been um, slightly attached and it was pulling on the cord and putting traction on it during the final mobilization. Uh, they, they identified it and sacrificed it. Uh, and then the case continued uh, and the uh, monitoring improved. Um, so the, again, this is the final construct. Uh, you can see from C5 down to T8. Postoperatively, she did very well. Uh, motor exam was four plus out of five throughout. She did uh, have a hoarse voice, unfortunately. Um, this is a nice illustration done, and, and this is uh, an article that was published in Neurosurgical Focus, which is free uh, by Dr. Moon and Annie, Dr. Chow, and Dr. Bourbon et al. Um, and what you can see is the initial um, uh, attempt on this was just to do a left-sided hemiclamshell thoracotomy. Um, a median sternotomy just doesn't afford quite the amount of access that you need for this. And so uh, the thought was a left-sided uh, would be more appropriate given that the majority of the tumor was on the left side. Um, during the dissection, the, the, the access to the right side of the tumor wasn't quite um, what was needed and there seemed to be attachments on the pleura and so they converted to the bilateral hemiclamshell. So you can see it's a median sternotomy and then that's carried laterally at the level of the fifth rib interspace. Uh, and then later when they had to be extended uh, uh, on the second cut out to the, uh, the fourth and fifth. And then this is just another cartoon demonstrating again, you can see the chordoma, uh, it's posterior to the pillar there. So that's gotta be resected. The left lung's being depressed. The heart is gently mobilized uh, as, as, as much as you can move it. And then um, the pleura was scored circumferentially around the tumor and then dissected immediately. So in conclusion, these are very rare tumors, um, particularly in the thoracic spine. Uh, On block resection is the best therapy to prevent local recurrence and achieve surgical cur 
secure. And, and I should mention um, in this uh, particular case, the biopsy track uh, was also resected intact as well to help prevent seeding. And then again, multidisciplinary surgical teams, as you commented, uh, are, are necessary to be involved, extensive preoperative planning. And then uh, typically, as we've, we've talked about, referrals to coordinary uh, centers are, uh, are, are paramount in these cases. Thanks, Tim. Really a, a fantastic case. Um, I'll take a, one quick question. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so um, no one has a question, we can, we can move on. I always have questions, but I, in the interest of uh, getting you through the program, I'll just uh, shut up right now. Fantastic case, but many questions. Uh, maybe in closing words, you can address how to direct biopsy, so it's a meaningful biopsy. This is another one of those things that drives me nuts. Biopsies are not equal biopsies, especially in these lesions. It's so important to have a relevant representative, uh, histologically relevant piece. So maybe in closing, you can identify how we should take an active leading role in having quality biopsies. Thank you. I'll be uh, shut. I'll shut up now. Take, take your answer off the air, right? Um, uh, no, I think that's uh, actually really uh, a good question. And, and I don't know how you have a crystal ball, but it's actually relevant because this uh, patient actually got two biopsies. Um, so certainly there's tumor heterogeneity or sampling error in these type of tumors. Some people advocate going for the most avidly uh, contrast enhancing uh, portion. Um, I think that's been a strategy that's been tried, but, but I think the best thing to do is, is um, number one, get a satisfactory sample, and that involves the pathologist to ensure that they have what they need. And then number two, if there's any question, I, I think repeating it as was done in her case, especially given that most chordomas occur over the age of 40, uh, and also most chordomas do not occur in the thoracic spine, uh, I think the thought was uh, to repeat this to, to adequately confirm that diagnosis. Great, um, we'll, we'll move on to the next case. Um, so I have the honor of presenting or introducing Dr. Dean Chow, who's professor of neurosurgery at UCSF. Um, he'll be presenting on a very interesting um, case of the cervical spine, and uh, I think you guys will, um, will, will enjoy this. So um, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Alekos. Thanks for inviting me. Happy to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a primary uh, cervical case here, and this is a gentleman who is 63 years old. He basically only had hand num numbness and had neck pain, and that was it. Totally normal, totally healthy guy, uh, very high functioning. And you can see on the MRI, he had this uh, T1 uh, image. When you gave GAD, it really didn't give, have any enhancement. If you look at C7 um, here, there's really not that much enhancement. Uh, and then if you look at the sagittal uh, T2 MRI, it was also dark. Uh, so it didn't light up bright like a chordoma on T2. And then you saw the CT scan, it was a calcified lesion. And this is in the soft tissue. So again, as the theme of the evening has been, get a biopsy first. So we got a biopsy first, and it comes back as sclerosing epithelial fibrosarcoma. So for those who aren't familiar with this, I had to go look it up myself. It's a very, it's a malignant tumor that is very slow growing, does have a risk of metastasis. It, the general treatment is an on block excision. It responds like most other sarcomas in that it doesn't respond to anything else. It doesn't respond to chemotherapy very well. Radiation is not great for it. And really surgery is the main uh, treatment for this. And then we got a nuclear medicine scan and no other sites of disease. And this is his only uh, uh, area where he had tumor. Uh, and then we got a CT angiogram just because of the location of C7 and where this tumor was gonna be and where you had to resect it uh, near the vertebral artery. Uh, and so the CT angiogram shows that the tumor is dorsal to the artery, dorsal and medial. And you can see the right artery, the right vert is his dominant artery. So even though you're down at C7, if you're gonna go anterior and you can see, if you're gonna go in the front, you really wanna think about getting an angiogram. 
So there's, there's a few things with this case that were very difficult. So number one, how are we going to unblock this thing without number one, tearing out all his nerve roots, tearing his vert, making him completely paraplegic. The second thing is that it's at the cervical thoracic junction. So it's at T1, C7. It's also invading the rib. Got to get this rib out. And the third thing is how are we going to get this guy to fuse? He's 63, completely healthy, very high functioning, owns his own business, high functioning guy. How are we going to get this guy to fuse, especially in face of radiation? So here's what we did. Uh, so when we did the the, the plan was basically, we went in through the, let me just tell you exactly how we did this. So we went in through the back and what we did was, I, I knew that it was not worth the risk of paralyzing this guy. And I knew that it didn't spill out like a cordoma, spilling out like cottage cheese, it was more tough, like shoe leather. So what I did was I went through the back and I completely just removed this paraspinal soft tissue component on block leaving the spine uh, separate. So there was a planned transgression through this tumor. But I, I said, you know, it's not worth paralyzing this guy or tearing his vert or tearing out his nerve roots. I just, so I just took this out so I can see the spine. And then it became a regular intra bony, intra lesional, not an intra, you know, a traditional bony removal. So here's the uh, anterior, this, here's the stymen pin in the uh, T1. This is the head, this is the feet, this is the right side. And you can, so you can see we're dissecting through and getting the C8 nerve root off and making sure that, and this side the rib has already been resected because there's no tumor. On the right side, we identified the rib and we did an osteotomy of the rib lateral to the tumor. So this piece uh, uh, would also come out lateral to the tumor and the, um, we planned that using the CT scan, looking at the measurements, looking at the distance uh, and taking that out. Uh, and then the pedicles of T1 have been cut and then dissecting uh, uh, through the, uh, the dura off. Eventually we use the Steinman pin to kind of hold the T1 vertebrae. I'll leave it there after we took out the disc of C7 T1. And then just dissecting uh, the dura, dissecting the C8 nerve root, Uh, and then getting this thing out uh, on block uh, when this thing came out and he was weak post-operatively, probably a, a two out of five in the right hand. So there clearly was some C8 nerve injury during resection uh, of that lesion. But he came back and, you know, it, it, it improved to probably four uh, out of five. And at the last follow-up, he's probably about a four to five right now. He has a good grip but he, uh, his coordination is weak. Um, so I suspect that during resection, there may have been some C8 nerve injury while pulling this thing out. And that's the one thing you wanna think about is that if you're gonna pull out a tumor from the front, you really wanna dissect that everything as much as you can from the back first. And I suspect we probably didn't dissect out enough, either in the foramen or, or ventrally, we probably didn't dissect out as, as enough as we should have. And that's probably why he had the weakness. So that's probably a, um, uh, something to consider. And then we reconstructed him uh, C7 to T2 with a cage. Uh, so this cage was basically filled with um, uh, this cage. So what we did was this cage was filled with iliac crest. So we went anterior iliac crest. So the first stage was posterior put the screws in, and we shelled out a ton of iliac crest and uh, focused on really good carpentry, especially through this area where the vertebrectomy was done on the left side. So all the facets were take were drilled very thoroughly, uh, decorticated extremely well to bloody bone, iliac, red iliac crest packed inside a ton of bone uh, on the, um, uh, the left side, the right side, was a uh, tricortical iliac crest, autologous iliac crest spanning uh, the, the gap to, to do that. And then the, the front was also iliac crest. So the whole thing was iliac crest. And then the, uh, we didn't radiate him until six months after the surgery. So we made sure that he had six months of healing 
before surgery, before radiation. That's it. He, and so far he's doing okay. He does still have that hand weakness, but overall, I think right now he's about uh, a four year follow up and he's holding up okay. That's fantastic. Um, well, I, I did have one question. In the setting of a, a primary tumor that encases the vertebral artery, how do you approach those? This wasn't the case in this. Uh, the, in those cases, uh, in those cases, if, if I, I can, you can do a test occlusion and see if they can so tolerate sacrifice. Uh, if they cannot, then you have to just do it. You have to do an intralesional, unfortunately. Okay. Great. Um, and for the, uh, can we do one more case or are we out of time? I think we're out of time, unfortunately. I mean, uh, we we should have, uh, I mean, it's fantastic. And this is uh, just amazing. I, I hope you'll do a part two in the near future. So many questions and uh so much uh, experience that comes through there. We do have our tumor course this weekend, um, and uh, you guys should just run that tumor course. We have some very nice faculty there, but uh, this is a spectacular display of uh, thoughtful surgical precision. And obviously so many things to discuss in terms of invasiveness of surgery versus patient expectations and how to uh, have a psychological buy-in of the patients that they actually know what they're getting into and can make a shared decision-making famous um, catchword, famous curse word. Uh, famous obligation for us um, to fulfill. So those are those are some of the um, immediate thoughts of mine. So every one of those cases was done absolutely beautiful, and I'm in awe of um, uh, the 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 care that was rendered here in all uh, regards. So thank you very much, UCSF and uh, team. A great group of people. We obviously all know that, um, and a really well put together uh, presentation uh, by all of you. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for having us. Take care. Thank bye you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye, Dean. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.